Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. Today we're going to talk about probability topics in the middle grades. And I, my name is Maria Hernandez. I teach at the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, and I am very lucky to have Alan Maloney here with us from the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation over at NC State University. This well, we'll is, just see how lucky she is. <laughs> this is our seventh um, session, our webinar this year, and the final one, unless I hear otherwise. Um, so this has been kind of a mixture of different types of um, mathematical topics and discussions about pedagogy in terms of the Common Core State Standards. And we've actually um, talked about topics that range from middle school to high school. And this was a big request when I kind of put it out there to the curriculum specialists in the area. Um, I asked, I kind of put together a list of things that I thought might be useful for folks. And then they gave me input too. And there was a resounding, yes, we would love to know more about probability topics in middle grades. And since I am not an expert in that area, I went and found an expert for you all. So um, Alan is going to uh, take it over from here um, and uh, let, you, let you know what you're in store for for today. And then I'll jump in later on when I'm requested. If you could, please um, make sure that your system is muted if you're just joining us so that you don't get the feedback. And also, there's a chat window available for you to participate. So feel free to chat in that chat window. I have Carol Stern here from the Distance Education Department over here at NCSSM. She's monitoring that chat window so that um, we can see when you have questions. Also, when we ask you to play along, if you uh, would please give us some response in the chat window, that would be great. Um, or if there's any difficulty, if you're having some difficulty, let, it, let us know. And um, I will turn it over to Alan. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, you will see that uh, Maria is the pro with this webinar business. I've only uh, done a couple of them so far. So if I start uh, uh, looking blankly at the screen because I don't know where I'm going, you'll understand why. Um, we're going to uh, talk from the standpoint of uh, student, really student learning and how to encourage student learning and conceptual understanding um, in uh, the topics of chance and probability. I will be working primarily from the Turn On CC Math site that we've been developing um, here at the Friday Institute. Um, but here's our goals for the session. We may get through all of them or most of them, uh, but in any case, we will have all, the entire PowerPoint, um, including any material we do not, that we either go over quickly or do not get to available for you to use afterwards. Um, I just thought it would be useful to recognize that this is pretty shaky ground for a lot of people. Um, we will do a sampling of observations as we go, but you can't just go through this stuff randomly. Maria's smiling. I'm glad you appreciate it. Um, with a little luck, we'll get some good outcomes on this. And we think, frankly, that the, the odds are pretty good that you'll develop a complementary knowledge to your previous theoretical knowledge of uh, probability. But all in all, you just have to investigate this stuff. And with uh, those tongue-in-cheek observations, we'll get into the real meat of the matter. Um, one thing that's really important to notice is that if you've read the Common Core Standards and you've dug into them enough to find where probability and chance are sort of tucked in there, you'll notice that probability and chance topics are really <laughs> undersold. Uh, but they really are critical for development of student reasoning. And one of the reasons for this is that in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, um, not very heavily prior to that, but in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, there's very heavy treatment, much heavier than there used to be in middle grades, of um, topics about data and distribution and statistics. You combine these with the probability and chance um, uh, understandings, and by the time you get to high school, these topics get merged into a much deeper treatment of statistics and probabilistic reasoning than had been done previously in conventional high school um, standards and curricula, uh, gets into the topics of statistical inference, probability density functions, sampling distributions, all of which require both an understanding of data distribution and statistical reasoning and probabilistic reasoning. So we're going to go through some of the um, sort of the critical principles from the early foundational understandings of uh, from, the, from the standpoint of student learning research. Um, mention issues of pitfalls in thinking about probability and work through some um, some examples and some problem setups that um, seem to be uh, give you high leverage in generating discussion and uh, growth of student understanding in classrooms. 
there's really only four standards in the Common Core that treat probability. They're all in seventh grade. They've been confined to that. And the Common Core standards really do not address issues of how students' probabilistic understanding, uh, understanding of chance and randomness and those topics develop in earlier grades. Uh, instead, it jumps immediately to calculate, calculating and analyzing probability from a quantitative stand for, standpoint and defining it pro, uh, numerically. And finally, it sort of defines it if you read this text, it sort of in the subtext defines it more or less in terms of fractions, although it does mention ratios. Um, this, the point of view we take from the learning sciences, um, in the, the research end of things here, is that uh, students really need to deal with um, their informal understandings of chance and probability. And a big part of, understand, of developing their understanding of these topics is to build it up to a, uh, a more formal, a more systematic treatment uh, and quantitative treatment of probability reasoning. But it doesn't start there. It starts with their informal understandings. And as I'll mention in a couple of places later on, um, we've added uh, bridging standards uh, to support instruction in these more informal earlier, um, earlier topics. So I've mentioned this a little bit already. Um, we come at it uh, in my group, um, and a lot of this work has been uh, started and generated by Jer Confrey, uh, who is now with uh, Amplify Learning. Um, but we've been working for a number of years now on issues of learning trajectories. The simple definition of this is research-based descriptions of student learning. And in particular, we pay attention to their conceptual development across time. And by time, we mean, in this case, years. And that fits in well with the way this, uh, the Common Core standards are built, because they are built to support conceptual understanding over years as the mathematical understanding accumulates and deepens. So the three main underlying features for learning trajectories uh, are that we emphasize big ideas that develop gradually over time. Uh, describes the transition that students bring in from their prior knowledge, what they bring into the classroom with them, to more sophisticated what we call target understandings or domain goal understandings, the top level mathematical principles that um, are the takeaway messages for so much of mathematical learning in schools. What we're trying to do is identify the intermediate understandings, how they can contribute to conceptual growth, and how, and how to recognize and build on these. Um, um, let me skip ahead just one bit here. Let me show you this map. This is the map of the K-8 standards that we've developed and is on the site of H, um, turnonccmath.net. What you'll see is 18 different sets of standards that are uh, identified as the learning trajectories. Um, I encourage you to go to the site and investigate it. If you click on any one of the hexagons, you'll get a set of descriptors, which are detailed descriptions of how the standards work in, um, embedded in these learning trajectories. And there are, I'm going back now in, this, uh, in the PowerPoint here, we unpack the Common Core standards uh, uh, with a set of five general types of what we call descriptors. Cognitive principles, strategies, inscriptions, and misconceptions that students uh, exhibit as they build their understandings of topics. Um, we try to identify mathematical distinctions that help students understand differences between different types of different approaches to mathematics and multiple models of understanding mathematics. Uh, wherever we can identify coherent pieces of structure that help students support their reasoning, we've done that. And then finally, I mentioned earlier the bridging standards, which are um, essentially additional standards that we've added into this. They're not part of the common core, but we've added them as part of the learning trajectories to help understand how instruction will help places where there are need to be additional pieces of um, instructional treatment embedded in these learning trajectories, something more than just the common core standards have. So this is an overview of our chance and probability learning trajectory. There are really two main sections of it. One is probability of simple events and probability of compound events. What we'll be doing today is only treating probability of simple events. The compound events add on levels of complexity, but there's just too much to cover in a short period of time. These are the, the standards that are found in the Common Core Standards document itself. Um, and we've broken them out by each of their individual um, uh, substandards. So there's really number 7.sp.5 through 7.sp.8. And this is how they appear in the hexagon map that I showed you a moment ago. So several points uh, as students move from informal to more formal understanding. And I'm going to have several slides through here that are sort of takeaway messages. 
One is that, uh, again, the learning trajectory is a way of understanding how students can progress from informal reasoning to more formal complex reasoning, and in this case about chance events and how these chance events can be modeled. Um, I emphasize that there has been some tension in, over the last several decades about whether probability and statistics topics are actually mathematics or they're just sort of applied numeracy. Um, point out and emphasize and say over and over again, probability is in fact part of mathematics. It's, it's simply that it's not a deterministic part of mathematics. Um, we understand from the research that early reasoning and probability really involves making distinctions about, um, among other things, among terms and concepts and helps help students to identify where their understanding is informal or in vernacular and where it needs to be more systematic and quantified. So we're going to here build, um, build on our framework um, to eventually end up comparing theoretical and empirical probabilities of what we call events. And eventually this builds up into, as students progress through this um, set of understandings, a way to define and model increasingly complex events, uh, conduct investigations, determine and infer probabilities, and eventually make evidence-based decisions in situations where there's a great deal of, of uncertainty. And part of, the, part of the art of probability theory is to understand where you can uh, identify places of lower uncertainty versus have to deal with issues of higher uncertainty. And if my, oops, sorry about that, slipped. Here we go. I want to come back to this slide a little bit later so we don't have to pay so much attention, but this is sort of a summary of examples of uh, the descriptor elements that I described a little bit earlier that are in the uh, probability learning trajectory. So let's start a conversation. I'm going to, let's see, I will just check. Maria, are you still able to hear me and tell me something? Yeah, I'm unmuted and I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, okay. Um, I just wanted, um, I assume that you'll be, while I'm looking at the, the PowerPoint here, you'll be able to flag me if uh, people are asking questions. Yes, I can do that. Carol's okay. watching the chat. Great. So, so everybody in the uh, in the audience out there in in our discussion here, please don't hesitate to interrupt with questions and so forth, and we'll uh, we'll try to give you responses as we go. So for the moment, let's let's think about how you start a conversation. What is the language of probability? The kind of informal language that we use in situations involving chance or uncertainty. What kind of things do you hear? It's just luck, you know. I'll just let you all read these along. I just pulled up a bunch of things, the kind of thing that you might hear. You could hear it in a classroom, you could hear it on TV, for instance, that one. And all of these exhibit various ways of expressing probabilistic reasoning, some of it formal, most of it informal, but most of it based on some perception of what it is to have a chance event in, in the mix. One of my favorites. I'd rather be lucky than smart. So kids live in this world of probability, probabilistic reasoning, uncertainty. It's usually informal. A lot of it they get their experience from games. Um, so they're reasoning about these things all the time. We believe from the standpoint of learning sciences, and this is backed up by a considerable amount of very, very good research over the past 15, 20 years, that kids are very capable of learning to reason more formally about probability as well as about statistics well before seventh grade. Um, the Common Core Standards don't call for that, but it does not mean that instruction should not include this as one goes forward. And even now, some of these things may seem like they're old-fashioned or old hat, but situations that are used as context for modeling probability are these I've listed here. The simple things that we're familiar with every day and we've all had in a class one way or another. Coin flipping, using spinners. We'll talk about spinners a little bit later. Um, drawing items from a collection without being able to see the items so you really don't know what's in there and you're trying to figure out what is in there. Um, more advanced formalized probability modeling. The typical kinds of examples that people start with are drawing cards from a deck of cards. These are just basic things that have been done for literally hundreds of years. Um, the weather. If you think about how the weather is talked about, it's above average, a higher probability, higher chance, lower chance. Well, are these theoretical probabilities? Is there some probability one can determine, or is it something that's based on an empirical model? All of us know it's based on an empirical model. 
And I invite all of you to just think about other situations that you're familiar with that you may have used in your classes or just used in talking with your own kids um, and other things you're aware of. If you've read USA Today, you see lots of very simple probabilistic statements, um, chance statements, and so forth. So I'm going to, if anybody wants to add in something else that's, we've missed here that you think are really important, please, uh, please chime in. Pause for a moment here. These are terms that are used over and over again in probability, in reasoning about probability. But for many of us, um, whether we've got a lot of experience with this or not, instructionally or professionally, uh, they're pretty squishy. They're things that we think we understand, we have a pretty good feel for. But when you get down to actually quantifying them or formalizing them or systematizing them, they may, it may turn out that you are not as secure in your understanding. I know that's been the case for me. Um, and it's really, it, it all, having a little bit of squishiness gives you the opportunity to, um, I would say, sympathize, empathize with your students and also uh, engage them in discussion of what these terms really, really mean and how do we move to a more formal, almost, if you would, controllable way of um, dealing with them, uh, but a more systematized uh, way of dealing with these terms. And I've listed here uh, a number of very common pitfalls or misconceptions that students will exhibit, um, will express um, about probability. For instance, that the probability of an event is, is simply one over the number of events. And we'll get to talking about what an event actually is in a few moments. Um, another one is that the number of objects in a population determines the likelihood of an event, when in fact, it's the ratio of a certain one or more set of outcomes that comprise an event relative to the total number of possible outcomes in a population. It doesn't have necessarily to do with the size of the, or the number of objects in a population. It may be the number of objects in a sample may determine a more uh, robust or uh, secure definition of probability in a given sample. Um, people typically confuse the odds of an event with the probability of an event, whereas the odds are really a ratio of two different probabilities rather than a probability itself. Here are two good ones that are going opposite directions. For independent trials on an experiment, an outcome in one trial increases the likelihood of the same outcome in the next trial, and vice versa. And in the other direction, you have an outcome that happens, now you're not going to get that outcome again. That's the reason. When in fact, if they're independent events, Actually, it doesn't matter what's happened before the probability of the next event, the next outcome is exactly the same. And here's uh, one that gets to the heart of people's understandings of randomness and predictability, the sense that if something is random, it's completely unpredictable. And it's random if you can't predict the result with 100% certainty. When in fact, the study of probability is all about understanding the structure of events that have an element of chance associated with them. And you probably can think of many others that you've seen in your own classes with your own students. And we won't tell anybody if there are misconceptions that you've stumbled upon that you find that you've had as well, because I think all of us have this, have various kinds of misconceptions where we're crossing the boundary between what chance and probability feel like in your daily experience versus the systematized, formal, mathematical treatment of chance events. So out to all of you who are participating, this list of five items here, are these chance events? And if so, why are they chance events? If you roll a six-sided die, is that a chance event? If you close a door, is that a chance event? Assuming you close the door with enough force to close it. I think we'd all recognize that if you deal a card face up from a deck of 52 different cards, that whatever card comes up is itself a chance event because you don't know which card is going to come up there with 52 different possible outcomes. I like the next two in particular. The event of snow occurring in Fayetteville in February 
that feels like a chance event because you never really know whether it's going to snow or not. However, the event of snow occurring in Fayetteville in June, that doesn't feel like such a chance event. Chances are pretty darn low that that's going to happen. The chance events are really, they're events for which there are one or more possible, there are multiple possible outcomes that you can't know for certain are going to happen. The theme of chance and randomness versus predictability is something that keeps recurring in probability, probability theory, probability studies. Um, it is a really good idea in classes to revisit this as you go through, as you in, uh, as your students learn more and more about probability as well as statistics, uh, because it, one's understanding of these topics changes the more you learn about probability. And it's always good to get this sort of meta level uh, discussion going um, uh, repeatedly in a class. And here's where also the kind of the situation where we begin to distinguish events from outcomes. Event is something that is happening, but outcomes are one or more possible ways that event could happen to get the same event. And that these are critical terms in probability reasoning. So here's a problem for you to, to think about. So I hand you a bag of marbles, and I tell you there are two colors of marbles inside it. There's, there's black marbles and there's white marbles. So here's an event. You draw a black marble. Now that's not saying you are drawing a black marble. That's the event of what's the probability of drawing a black marble out of that bag. Here's another event, the event of drawing a white marble out of the bag. Are these two events equally likely? Ponder that for a moment. And I'm also giving you these, all of these scenarios are things that you could do in your class and should generate quite a bit of discussion among the students and maybe even debate. And that is, that's where you want to be because that helps the students figure it out, consider it from different standpoints and wrestle with their informal understandings. So here's another situation. So this time I'm going to give you a bag of marbles. I'm going to tell you there are two colors inside. There's black and white. But now I'm going to tell you the bag has 30 marbles. 20 of them are white and 10 of them are black. So what's the probability of drawing a marble from that bag? That's the definition of event number one. And what's the probability of drawing a white marble from that bag? Okay, now it's participant participation time. Somebody tell us how you think about each of those events. So here's where we encourage you to type in the chat window. There are lots of folks out there, so if you guys could help us play along with us here. I'm going to pop out and take a look at the outside here. Probability of drawing a black a black marble is that what we're looking at now? Or you're going back to the uh, go back to the previous one. Yeah. yeah, let's go back to well. When I pop out, it gives me the whole screen. Okay, we're going back in here. Here we go. Go so one more, Alan, so we can see the two questions, or the two, please. There we go, sorry, thanks. The probability of drawing a marble and then the probability of drawing a white marble. Nobody's gonna participate. We're getting a quiet crowd here. <laughs> I'll start calling on people, that's the way I am. That's right, that's right. <laughs> We're not going any further until somebody talks. That's right, somebody's gotta help us. Marie, Alan, can you hear me? This is Teresa. Yeah. Hi, Teresa. Yeah. I, my chat window has disappeared. When you started, it disappeared. That's why I can't enter anything. Oh, okay. can you look at the top? Uh, there's a green uh, line that says viewing Alan Maloney's desktop, and you can pull it down and see the click on the chat box. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. From... Uh, you see? Yep. Got yep. Now we've got some responses from Barry. Barry says 100% for the first question and 33.3% for the second one. And then we also have a response from Teresa. She says 
one, you will always draw a marble, so probability is one. Alan, did you hear those responses? Yep, I did. Okay. I did. And then also from Barry, it says should be 66.7% for the second. Yep. And this is one of those situations where, unlike dice, when you have marbles in a bag, the probability of a simple event of drawing simply one marble out of the whole bag depends on the ratio of the marbles in the bag. But the, the probability is the number of ways you could draw the black marble compared to the number of ways you draw any marble. And the answer to this question, of course, is no, they're not equally likely. And this also gives you a sense of, um, uh, in standard 7SP5, they talk about the probability uh, of an event being between 0 and 1. And the 1, or the 100%, is the baseline for something that happens all the time that is completely certain, as in drawing a marble from a bag of marbles. And Okay, scenario number three. Bag of marbles, black and white. 30 marbles, 10, or 10 black, 20 white. Now, the probability of black versus white are the two events equally likely. You all out there know that they're not equally likely, and you undoubtedly are going, okay, we're going to go through this again, huh? And the students have to wrestle with the question of, is the probability of drawing one the same as the probability of drawing the other, and why? And getting to the issue of the difference in the number of each, so the chance of drawing one at random, not knowing what's there, and just grabbing one that you can't see, depends on, from the theoretical standpoint at least, depends on the relative numbers of one color versus the other color in the bag. I would say that, well, let's see, let's go to the last issue. So here's another thing that students can sometimes answer that the probability of an event or the probability of two different events is going to be the same. It's going to be 50-50 or it's going to be equal, equally likely. But that's not without knowing. Uh, I mean, that's without knowing what the event is. But sometimes students will simply say, if you're going to um, draw one marble from a bag, regardless of the color, they will simply say, because there are two kinds of marbles, the probability is one half that you're going to get one, or they're equally likely to draw one as another. And that's um, an intermediate understanding. It can generate, give you the opportunity to generate a lot of discussion. And the kids in the class will probably debate that among themselves, given an opportunity. So this this set of questions really gets at the idea that well we have you, you have to def, you have to model these situations probability event depends on other issues that you know and how would you know what the probability is you help you have the opportunity to define what the things you need to know are in order to define the probability of any particular event and again a lot of these situations are just really our ways of signaling to you places where Students, this is before you even get to the to any kind of rigorous or systematic treatment of defining the numerical values of probabilities, but varieties of contexts and situations that are slightly or that are at least slightly different that give students a chance to reason about what you need to know in order to determine what the likelihood or the probability of something is. And one of the things you need to know is for any given event, how many outcomes comprise that event? For instance, if you're going to draw two marbles out of one of those bags of marbles, then how many ways could you get? You could get a white marble and a white marble. You could get a white marble and a black marble. You could get two black marbles. Different outcomes will have um, different likelihoods, and each of those outcomes feeds into the event. If you if you are drawing if you want to know the probability of drawing two marbles, both of which are black, that's a different event than drawing two marbles, one of which is black and one of which is white. How many possible outcomes are there overall versus how many outcomes are there that could be that could qualify as satisfying the particular event? Um, one thing the, stand, the Common Core Standards sort of takes for granted is the issue of sample space. 
The sample space has to be determined very carefully by students who are determining probability because it is the number of outcomes in the sample space that is in fact the denominator or the base ratio in, or the base value in a ratio that determines a probability. So let's talk about, let's switch context now and talk about a roll of a die. So we've got a six-sided, and in every case we'll say, we'll assume that it's a fair die unless we say otherwise. So the question is, a sing, uh, the situation is that you're making a single roll of a six-sided die. The event is rolling a two. What's the probability of rolling a two? What are the possible outcomes? Well, you could roll a one, or you could roll a two, all the way up to six. So there's six possible outcomes. The outcomes for the event that we stated, there's only one outcome. You can get a two. If you don't get a two, you don't get a two, or you get a two. So the probability of rolling a two is one outcome, that is rolling a two, out of possible of six outcomes for the actual um, the roll. So the probability of getting a two is one over six. Now it's expressed as a fraction, but it's really a ratio of one possible outcome relative to all of the possible outcomes. So here's an interesting situation. We're going to add a die. So now we have two six-sided dice. Um, we want to ask the question, let's, what is it? We're going to roll a three. That's the event. What's the probability of rolling that three? And how do you think about this? Critical thing about this, now we're starting to think about um, quantifying probabilities. We've made this move to understanding what outcomes are, what outcome spaces are, sample spaces. What's the probability of the event of rolling a three? Well, we have to figure out what the, what the outcome space is. You could roll a two. You can only roll that by getting a one on one die and a one on the other die. You roll a three by getting a one on one die and a two on another die, or a two on one die and a one on the other die, and so on and so forth. So I've listed the number of possible outcomes for rolling each particular value of the total of two dice. There's a total of 36 possible outcomes, as long as you're distinguishing between one die and the other die. If you roll a double five, you don't know which one is one and which one is the other, so there's really only one way to roll a double five. Now, there are two ways to roll a three. There are 36 ways to roll two dice, so the probability of rolling a three is two out of 36, or one to 18. So we're going to go back to the same question or same situation, but now we're going to pose a different different question to the to the students. There are two ways of counting the outcomes. You can distinguish between the different valued single dice or not. And this question comes up over and over again. It came up for us when we were writing the learning trajectory itself. Do you count when you if you roll an eight? Do you count one and seven and seven and one as two different outcomes or only one? After all, you can't really distinguish between the dice if you roll them at the same time, right? Come up with a 1 and a 7. What difference would it make? Here's a question for you all. What difference would it make to the theoretical probabilities of rolling any particular value? And here's where I'm going to call on Maria because I'll leave this, uh, I'll leave the desktop up so I won't be able to see your, um, uh, see the interface for the, uh, for the session. So what do you think your students would say to this question? So Alan, do, do we really want a one and a seven? Is that what you're talking about when you're talking about the die, that we just have a maximum of seven? Oh, no. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I mean, just in general, what difference? This is sort of a a thought question at this point, but it can be calculated. What difference would would any particular what, what what would it make? What difference would it make to any particular event if you counted the dice, uh, the situation of of two different dice as two different possible outcomes or one? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So 
So another way of asking this question is, so we've, we've posed this question, how would you go about determining whether there is a difference to count those two outcomes as two different outcomes or only one? And similarly for any other situation in which you could have two different two different combinations. And so if you guys have, to, if you have got, guys have comments or responses to that, let us know. Just chat in the chat window. I have a comment uh, from um, M. Farmer. It would make a different number of outcomes if the dice were different colors. Ah, good point. So that would be a way of actually defining the dice as the two dice as different dice. So would that be the situation, in this case, would that be the situation where you would count two different outcomes for one and seven or two different outcomes for two and three or any two different uh, numerical values on the dice? Or is that only one? It may seem a sort of trivial question, but it's important to make that, dis it's, these are one of the kinds of distinctions that's really important for learners to grapple with and recognize why they're saying why they're making these justifications. So um, when you're chatting in the window, if you select send to everyone, then everyone will see your chat items. Uh, and uh, M. Farmer added, uh, you would then have 36 outcomes instead of 18. Right. And I haven't counted the other way in, in a long time. Is it actually 18? <laughs> Somebody do a quick count. So if, you, so if you think about it in terms of different die, you have your six doubles, right? Right. Double right. fives. Yeah, that's what somebody just counted. Teresa counted that. For an outcome of seven, we distinguish between three and four being rolled versus a two and a five. Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. so, a, so for seven, a total of seven, Teresa asked if we're distinguishing between three, four, two, five. Yes. Yes, we are distinguishing between yeah, those. A two and but a three. Not distinguishing between three, four versus four, three. That's right, right. Okay. That's right. So eight, 18 is right, Alan, because you have the six double ones, and then right. you have six um, times two, which is 12. Is that right? Seems like there might be fewer. Can't count. We're having trouble counting this one. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's that's one of the challenges of probability, right? Is actually counting right. different outcomes. <laughs> it's a lot of all that. Okay. Let's step away for just two seconds. Mm -hmm. There we go. So everyone agrees that it's, it's two different values. We would settle on one value. We think it's 18. Yeah. So you can actually determine what difference it makes in the probability. So, so the and we have is, another question here. It says, but what yeah. if two dice are thrown not at the same time? Ah, good point. So what if? Class discussion. That was actually the way I thought about it at first. I thought, well, if we throw the two dice at the same time, then we're always distinguishing between the two because we can see the two dice as opposed to throwing one, then throwing right. the other one, and not and not caring about whether it's three, four, or four, three. And right. then we have another comment. Couldn't we think of the two dice 
just as we would a die and a spinner. Oh, that's interesting. So you have a spinner with six numbers on it. Is that what you're saying? Yep. yep. So would that be would that be an equivalent model? I think it would, because really you have you're basically asking for two independent events that comprise a single event. That one of which is one, you get one value out of six possible values, and the other one you get one value out of six possible values. Right. So then so, yeah. Sherry says, wouldn't that give us back thirty six? Yes. Yeah, that would. Yeah. That's right. I like that example because it does kind of help distinguish between the two. It's not like I got to figure out if I'm counting, uh, you know, if I have to remember what what happened on one die next time I throw the second die. Okay, go back to the counting of the possibilities if you don't distinguish between the dice. I'm coming up with 21. Because there's one way to get two. There's only one way to get three. Two ways to get four, which would be one and three and two and two. Two ways to get five. Three ways to get six. Three ways to get seven. Three ways to get eight. Two for nine, two for 10, and one each for 11 and 12. What about four ways to get five? Well, let's see, one and four and two and three, but four and one and three and two are the same, right? Because we're not distinguishing between the dice in that case. Oh, she changed it to three. Yeah, she changed it to three. Right, she's got it. Okay. So I'll leave this for a question for your classes but you can design a way to answer what is the correct way to determine the probability of rolling any value two through 12 with two six-sided dice that are identical. And what the students will discover is that the probabilities, that empirical probabilities, if they do enough uh, repetitions, enough trials of this, will end up showing, will end up converging toward the probabilities that you get if you count two different values, if you distinguish between the dice, excuse me. I only saw a part of what Sherry just put up there. What, what was the whole remark? Same questions will definitely come up in the classroom. It's good to have an idea of where you're heading with your class. <laughs> right, right. right. And, and one of the values of learning trajectories, the way that we have these outlined in the, um, in the Turn On CC Math site and what learning trajectories try to do in particular, is as you understand what the research says about how students, and this is research in classrooms as well as outside of classrooms, if enough work gets done, you will be able to, uh, if not enough work on the learning trajectories, if they're detailed enough, teachers will get a much better idea of what to anticipate is likely to come up in the classrooms ahead of time. Now, students will come up with something new all the time, but the range of possibilities, this is itself a sort of a probabilistic question. It is. Sort. The range of probabilities, the range of possible responses is not infinite. It's relatively predictable. And the more you know about how the students tend to build their understandings, the more you can anticipate and be prepared for what they're likely to say. And that's not to simply necessarily give them a, uh, an answer to correct them. That's not what I'm talking about. But you can anticipate how to build the discussion and the, what we call the classroom discourse among the kids uh, in ways that they can build their own understanding of it and eventually come to, you know, wherever possible, come to consensus that is actually matching a next level up of conceptual understanding that they can also build by making arguments and bringing evidence to the table about why these answers are correct or why they're valid, why they work in 
a given situation. That's one of the really powerful things about learning trajectories. So um, let's move to the a little more discussion of the issue of modeling, because this is this follows from this question. Let's see if we go back here. This question of designing this a way to answer the this question. It really involves making a, an, a probability investigation. And for most intents and purposes, these are the steps that most people will use in doing basic probability investigations. And this is one of these coherent structural components, coherent structure that I referred to earlier, that surfaces in, in the probability learn, chance and probability learning trajectory. Uh, how do students engage in probability investigations? And there's a routine. The details may be different in every diff different situation, but there's a way to design and follow these in, and design these investigations and carry them out. You pose a question, refine the question so it seems like it's going to be able to be answered, define what events you're actually asking about, then define the outcomes and the outcome space for that event. And in doing so, you establish the theoretical probabilities. So if you have a spinner, for example, I'll go back to the, di the dice example. You know the outcome space is, si there are six, of, six outcomes for rolling a single die. And you can ask the question, well, what's the probability of rolling an odd number? So there are three possible outcomes for rolling an out odd number. You can roll a one, or a three, or a five, versus all of the outcomes you could imagine, which is six. So the probability of rolling an odd number is one-sixth, right? Oh, no, sorry, three-sixths. It's a 50% chance. Then, and here's where the stuff really gets interesting, is you, you generate data. And then you, answer the, you try to answer the question using the experimental probabilities. And you've made some certain assumptions in step four about, about the, the nature of the event itself and the nature of the tool you plan to use to generate the empirical probabilities. And a lot of the issues in probability reasoning are comparing what you get from an experiment relative to what you believe you would get if everything was perfect and you were able to run, well, give away the secret here, infinite numbers of trials. And the final art of this and where you can generate all kinds of discussion in the classrooms is interpreting these results you get. The arguments get going fast and furious, but it, it allows kids to surface what they understand and what assumptions they're making that are so inherently important to the whole process of modeling a, situa a situation. Maria, your turn. Calculator simulation. You ready? Oh, can't hear you. If you can pass me the ball, then we'll... Uh, oh, yeah, right. Sorry about that. Calculator. No problem. Let's see. Oh, no, let's see. I have to figure out how to get back here. Now, let's see. I have to get my interface back. You pull that tab down, maybe, and then you can see participants. You see the green tab at the top of your screen? There we go. Got it. Then you can it I'll end up passing the ball to somebody else, I'm sure. Let me open my window a little bit also, more. Also, um, while you're working on that, too, we have a couple of comments and questions. Um, it says, could you identify the difference and or similarities in the terms outcome, sample space, and, and the event that come up? Can you read the rest of it? They, uh, they come up in the study of probability i.e. selecting a letter from the word mathematics. Okay. Say the question again now that I understand the context. Yeah. Could you identify the differences and or similarities in the terms outcomes, sample space, and events that come up in the study of right. probability? Right, right. For example, selecting a letter from the word mathematics. Okay. So... If you have, it, it, it partly it's going to depend on how you imagine it, but if you imagine all those letters as individual objects and you've got them randomly assorted um, and you just grab one, the event would be what your result would be 
you define a particular result you want to get and then look at the probability of that. But that, that event, that result, may, may be, um, there may be multiple ways of getting that result. And those, each of those different ways of getting that result is an outcome for that event. The entire sample space or outcome space is all the possible ways of doing the action you're going to do whether or not you get the particular result you're looking for. Does that make sense? And Marie, I have the ball back to you. Looks like you're ready to share your desktop, right? Yeah. Okay, now I'm unmuted. And I think I'm ready to share my desktop. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do is just do an example, because um, I thought it might, might be kind of nice to show you some different kinds of technologies. Um, but I think, like Alan has talked about, I think it's important for kids to have a chance to conduct some of these simulations with some type of hands-on activity at first. So, of course, we can't do that with a webinar. But anything that you can do to bring into the classroom to simulate some of these particular um, ideas, is, I think is very valuable for the kids to kind of get their hands on it. Um, also, it's interesting when you think about designing some type of activity and ask the kids to even help you design an activity that would help you simulate. For example, if you don't want to bring coins in the class and have people flipping coins all over the place, it can get kind of crazy. But if you ask kids to think about, could there be something easier that we could do here in the classroom to simulate it, they might come up with an idea like, we could have paper bags with different colors of piece of pa pieces of paper in there. And with, if we thought about having the same number of green pieces of paper as white pieces of paper, then that might be an easy way to simulate something like that. That was just an idea I had, because I know it can be kind of crazy when you think about hands-on activities. Um, and so what I'd like to do then is think about after you've given the kids an opportunity to touch something with their hands, to move to the technology as a second step. And I wanted to show you um, a couple of different ways to do a sample problem. And then we're going to pool our data and collect the data as a whole. So what I'm going to do is if you have a TI-84 um, on you or an 83, we can run a simulation where what we're going to do is we're going to toss um, a coin, we're going to pretend like we're tossing a coin 50 times, and we're trying to think about how many heads we might expect if we toss a coin 50 times. So um, I'm going to escape out of here so I can show you. I have this in the PowerPoint so that when you get back to your classroom, if you want to, um, you know, if you don't remember all the, all the um, button pushes, the, the keystrokes, you'll have that. But I'm going to escape out of here the simulator uh, or the emulator. And I'm going to show you how we can do this. Let me get out of this. I actually was playing with something earlier. And I'm going to show you this other app, too. But if you have um, an 83 or an 84, sorry, I'm just going to get out of this. Then what we can do, and this is actually kind of, a, I was talking to a person who teaches statistics here, and that's one of the things that they actually ask kids to do in AP statistics, is to model some kind of simulation with either some technology or some other way so if you think about um, tossing a coin, one of the ways we can simulate that is to use a random number generator. Let me turn off this step plot. Weird. There we go. Let me turn off this step plot, sorry. I was just playing with the calculator. And what we could do is use a random number generator to generate an integer between, quote unquote, between 0 and 1, inclusive. So that means that we would be generating numbers, sorry, um, we would be generating either zeros and 1. So to do that, I've got the calculator stuff in there for you. But what we're going to do is we're going to hit the math button. So if you're playing along with me, if you go to math and you arrow over to probability, then there are all these different things under probability here. Rand generates a random number, and you can give it a range. But what I want is number five, which is rand int. And the way this works is it's expecting, oops, sorry, I picked the wrong one. 
math, probability. You can either hit the number five or arrow down to five. This, this emulator is pretty slow, so I'm just going to hit the number five. And it's expecting, uh, it could be expecting just two parameters. Uh, normally, what you could do is say the number from zero, and then you put a comma and one. So that means it'll generate a random integer between zero and one inclusive. And then if you wanted to do it several times, you could put another parameter in there, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to show you how it works. So I just hit enter and enter and enter. And if I think about it, if I say, well, I'm going to let one represent tossing the coin and getting a head, then I can count up, I can do this 50 times, and count up how many heads I get. So that's certainly one way to do it that could be arduous and time consuming. But the good news is you could put um, a third parameter in this command that says, I want you to do this 50 times. And then we can actually collect the data and put it in one of our lists. So that's what I'd like to do next. What I'd like to do is go to math, arrow over to probability, and then choose randint. And we're going to say from zero, comma, one, comma. And we're going to generate 50 of these numbers. But if I just hit, if I hit enter now, then I'll get these numbers kind of spewed across the screen, which I can do. And what I'd like to do is store them into a list. So if you hit your store button, which is right up on the keypad here in the bottom left hand corner, can y'all see my mouse? Yes. So if I hit store and then I hit second L1 and hit enter, then it will take all of the data and put it in my, my list. So if I hit stat, edit, then in that first list, these are just ones and zeros. And, and because I've decided to uh, model this in this way where one represents a head and a zero represents the tail, now it's really easy for me to count up the number of heads because I can just sum the elements in, those in that list. And again, I have those keystrokes for you and you'll have the archived webinar if I'm going to fast. I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to go to math. No, sorry. I'm going to go to uh, list. So let's go to the list operation. So hit second stat, which is list and go over to math, different math. And there's a sum command, which is number five. So we'll do sum the elements in L1 and then hit enter. So you can see that for these 50 trials, I, I uh, tossed the coin uh, 50 times and I got 21 hits. So this is kind of an easy way to get your kids if they have um, 83s or 84s in their hand to to generate these numbers. I'd like to just take a quick poll. Can you just do a ra raise your hand if you have access or your kids have access to this type of technology in the classroom? Because I know for middle grades, not everybody has this. Maybe if they're algebra or, yeah, algebra one teachers or. I can actually see how they raise hands. Um, oh, I thought you could raise your hand somehow. Okay. Um, Dean says yes, Teresa says yes, okay. Barry says yes. <laughs> so we have a couple of yeses in there because I don't want to be like talking about something that, no, you get back to your classroom, you don't have that technology. But you can do this, you know, have the kids do this several times. Even one kid could do 50 of these or maybe five trials. And then what's nice about this is you can pull the data all together. And um, going back to the ideas of some of the topics in sixth grade, when you think about creating, I think of it as a histogram, but you could just think of it as a dot, dot plot. So if I go back to the PowerPoint, then we could collect the data together. And what we're doing is along the horizontal axis, I would put the number of heads that had occurred. So I could actually sample the room. I could say, well, who got, you know, 19 heads or 10 heads when they did this, when they did this 50 times. And so we can kind of get a range across the horizontal axis. Maybe somebody got as few as 10 heads. And somebody said they had the uh, 73. 73. So I don't know if you can do this on the 73. We just taught them how to do it. It was lots of fun. Oh, great. That's great. I'm not familiar with the 73. So then you could put up here, you could actually just do a dot plot where everybody would come up and on the board, they could put a little dot on the board um, to kind of represent the histogram. So this, what this, I think this activity does is give the kids an opportunity to kind of see what some of the things Alan was talking about was that you know, this idea of experimental probability is not going to be exactly the theoretical probability. In fact, when I did this and I collected the data, I got very few 25s, and that would be something that we would kind of work towards 
in terms of an expected value. I think. And a comment from Jenny, you can download the probability simulator. Oh, great. Awesome. Right. So I have that here, too. And I know we're kind of running out of time, and we wanted to show you some other technology. So let me just show you real quick that if you have, there's an app on the 84 that's the probability simulator. And if you hit alpha P, it'll get you down to the P's. And I, um, if you go to this probability simulator, it's pretty cool. Like someone just mentioned, you can toss a coin. And you can actually roll a die and make the, um, you can actually make it like a, a weighted die, an unfair die. And if I go over here to um, set, you could say, well, I want to set the trials to 50. And you could go down here and change this to clear table. That way we won't be accumulating these. We're just going to clear them out every time. And again, I have this in the PowerPoint as the keystrokes. But if you do this and you say, OK, these top keys are what, what you're looking at now. If I say toss, then it has this nice little coin toss there. And it's showing you each toss. And you can see it's building a histogram for the number of heads and tails. And then if you use the arrow key, not the trace key, but the arrow key, you can count how many heads you got there. And then you've got 28 heads. So that's kind of a nice, quick way to do the simulation free on the um, 84 if you have an 84. And it is so critical that the students work with different kinds of reputa uh, representations, just as it is with almost any other kind of mathematics, um, any branch of it, so that they, because they reason, you'll, you'll reason differently depending on the representation. It'll, again, each representation is a model in itself, and it shows certain things, and it doesn't show other things. Working across multiple representations helps students understand that aspect of modeling, but it also helps students reason about different aspects of the probability, like, uh, the probability investigation. So I know we're running out of time, and some people might have to leave us, but I just want to make it, we can go ahead and keep talking a little bit, but what I want to do is let everybody know that we will have all of these materials available on the website, so in case you do have to sign off. But there are a couple of other things I just wanted to show you. Actually, just one other um, technology that I wanted to show you. And then, Alan, I don't think we're going to get to the spinner activities. I think uh, we'll probably fine. have to wrap up. But yeah. one of the other things that um, I just wanted to show folks, just to, for you to kind of explore on your own, are these NCTM core math tools. And you can download these and pull the whole suite down onto your machine. I've talked about them before at other webinars. Really nice tools. One is a simulation tool that has um, a, a one where you can toss coins, and then it, like like the activity that I just ran, it showed you there how many heads and tails you got for a particular um, experiment. So you know, play with those, and then these were just some of the. Um, this was what I showed you just now on the probability simulator activity. So um, in terms, should we just cut to the the very end there, Alan? Since we're sure, running? go right ahead. Yep. Okay. So Alan's got all these great simulator, I mean, these spinner um, investigations that are available on the Schroeder website, if y'all haven't seen those. And I think we just want to talk about this last this last slide. So I'll let you talk about that. Sure. Alan. And this is what I said we were going to come back to a little bit late, uh, later. We wait, I flashed this slide up before. And just I just put it here to remind you that what we've tried to do is give you a little walk through how to think about the learning trajectory as a way of progressing from informal reasoning, generating lots of discussion in the classroom by lots of different activities in order to generate a consensus as well as instructional settings where you are helping them become more systematic and to build ways of conducting more complex reasoning about chance events and about increasingly complex events as well. Um, the reason is the reasoning becomes inherently more formal and mathematical. Um, the early reasoning is really important to establish the ability and the willingness of students to make distinctions and to question these distinctions if they can't make sense of them, so that they make more sense out of these increasingly complex situations. And we, of course, we haven't even touched compound events, uh, and they become they can be very very tricky. Um, so the, the challenge is to systematize and quantify our reasoning about chance events while always keeping in mind that we are modeling situations that are in, either in the world or invented. 
that help us make sense of these events that are to one degree or another random, but certainly have multiple outcomes. Um, eventually, we can make uh, the students can understand how increasingly they can use this type of reasoning to determine probabilities, infer them from events that they see in the world, and make evidence-based decisions based on situations that have uh, uncertainty uh, as an inherent part of them. And let's see, I was going to mention, oh yeah, oh thanks Maria. Um, this is a, a recap of a couple uh, of the five different descriptor elements that you'll see uh, that we use to organize the, um, uh, the descriptors in the turnonccmath.net site. Um, the, an example of student misconceptions is that random means unpredictable or without any structure. That's one thing that comes out and can, repeatedly shows up in student reasoning. Um, among the underlying cognitive principles that help us understand that are continuing underpinning cognitive themes of probability is that probabilities are ratios of outcomes versus outcomes in the entire outcome space. And that probability is a modeling uh, and a comparison between theoretical situation and empirical situations to help us understand how far we have to go to be able to be, as I say in some of the slides that we haven't talked about, satisfied that what we're finding in the experiment, in fact, does or does not, in fact, match the theoretical probability. And that helps you understand, uh, answer questions like, is a die fair, or is a spinner fair, and how would you know? Um, distinguishing events from outcomes is one of those one of the sort of basic distinct mathematical distinctions we make in the probability field. Uh, the structure uh, example of the coherent structure that runs as a theme through this is the structure of investigations, which I showed in a slide earlier. And then you'll see as if you get into turn on CC math, the bridging standards it's set up. The first two standards are actually bridging standards that are set up to help guide you through the more informal parts uh, and the vernacular parts of students' understandings of probability before you even get to the first official standard in the Common Core. Um, uh, 7SP5 that talks about quantifying probabilities. So there we are, and I think now we've got yeah we've got a bunch of a uh, bunch of resources in there that we've talked about, and uh, all of these are uh, available uh, for free without any cost with, uh, and uh, are accessible to you for use in classes. And Alan's folks have put together a, a great list. Um, that it's in a, also in a PDF document that we'll make available on our, on our website. These are a couple of things that we have used today. And then this live binder site, it kind of changes depending on what you go look for, but I found a couple of, of nice um, activities in these two um, links. And then the Illustrative Math Project also has um, some good stuff for K-8 in this area. Also, in terms of professional development in the summer, these are just some things that I know are coming up. The NCTM Summer Institute, there's a summer institute in New Orleans, I believe, for middle grade. There's one at the end of the summer in Washington, D.C. for high school. Meredith College has some math and science institutes that they're running this summer, so I just thought I'd put, put these up there and you can do a Google search on them. The MELT workshops, which MELT is an acronym for something at Appalachian State that has to do with some, I think they did some really successful workshops last summer for Common Core State Standards, and then the Phillips Exeter Academy High School Workshop happens at the end of June, and I'll be a uh, presenter at that, and I'll also be a presenter up at the NCTM Summer Institute for high school folks. So um, it, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Alan, so much for being here with us. And um, I just want to let you guys know that uh, Carol and I are very interested in um, your feedback. So she will send you a link to a survey where you'll have an opportunity to talk to us about this particular um, webinar, but all of the webinars. If you've been to other webinars and you want to just give us some feedback, we're trying to think about um, future webinars for next year. You know, what do people need? Will we be able to have the resources to provide someone to do these throughout the school year? And if there are particular topics that you're interested in as well, feel free to um, give us that input. Alan, did you want to say anything else? No, that's got it covered. We'll, we'll uh, probably just tweak the PowerPoint a little bit to make any little corrections that need to be made, and then we'll post it, and you all can ha have at it. Okay, thank you all very much. Thanks for those of you who participated and asked questions and uh, gave us answers. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everybody.